<clears throat> hello, hello, hello. This is Attorney Mike Kravlin coming to you from Chicago. As usual, thank you all in the chat for telling me about my horrible thumbnail. I still don't know if it's fixed. I'm on about the fourth iteration. <sighs> but we've got ourselves a really, really interesting case. Uh, I, th this is out of Tennessee, I believe. Judge's name is David Wolf. Um, let's let's just get start, started. Sorry, I was trying to fix the thumbnail. Public defender. Case is set for trial Thursday. Um, Okay, so this is Judge Wolf. I this isn't the main thing. There's a there's a long sentencing, actually diversion request that comes up, but this is just to give you a little flavor because I don't I've seen him before, but I don't think I've had him on the channel. Right here is also a very very interesting situation. We have not reached an agreement, so I'm assuming but, it's going to go forward on that day. Well, it would, Your Honor, if I could find the victim. I've sent officers out to her, well, the defendant's house is where she's thought to be living, requested subpoenas well in advance. She has not been found. Um, I would request a little bit more time, but I understand that Mr. Hooper might have a motion that he'd like to make, so I don't, it, I can't go to trial without her, but. And, Your Honor, that's one of the main reasons my client is sitting in jail, so we'd ask for it to be dismissed. If one of the reasons? He has a violation of probation out of McEwen. <laughs> this judge, uh, I like him. He's very conscientious. He's very careful. He he knows what he's doing. And, uh, that you know, the, the defense attorney says, well, that's one of the reasons my client's in jail. He's like, oh, really? Which <laughs> only one of the reasons now. The state can't find their witness. I, I think it's a DV situation. I'm not sure. I think it's a DV situation, and it's like she's not cooperating. That I don't think they'll ever find the witness. And uh, Miss James is his probation officer. One of the grounds of that, uh, uh, not mistaken, are these charges. So if this were to be dismissed, there's a pretty good chance that's going to waste it. Well, the docket here shows the following. And the indictment was issued in December of 2021. He was arraigned, and a trial date was originally set for April um, the 12th of 2022. He was supposed to hire his own lawyer, and on, April, on February the 11th of 2022, he did not uh, hire a lawyer, <clears throat> and he was not present, did not provide proof, so there was conditional forfeiture of his bond, and it was a hold for hearing. He was then arrested. Um, um, at some point, alias Capus in March of 2022, and in April of 2022, his uh, your office was appointed. He was set for the first setting for trial. His bond was set at fifty thousand dollars, and uh, so that's where we are. So <clears throat> I'm going to deny your motion to dismiss, reduce his bond to ten thousand dollars, and uh, set a new trial date. Mr. Beard, I'm not. At this point, ready to dismiss because you missed a prior trial date, I'm going to give the state one opportunity to try to locate the alleged victim, but I'm going to reduce your bond down to $10,000, which should help you get out of bond, out of jail on bond pending the new trial date, which will be. I'm looking real quick. Sorry. Um, right there, you can tell where he leans. A lot of judges would dismiss this case because the state's not ready for trial. Uh, it was continued one time previously, but it was continued uh, because the defense wasn't around, not not because not because of the state in that circumstance. Uh, and he said, "All right, I'm going to give him an opportunity, even though I think everyone in the room knows that it's not likely they'll ever get the witness." April 13th, April 10th for plea. April 13th for trial, April 10th for the plea. And obviously, if you're out on bond, stay in touch with your lawyer. Yes, sir. Uh, that's, what my, that's what my bond is now, correct, Your Honor? Your bond, as of this moment, your bond is $10,000. Isn't that what it already was, Your Honor? It was not? I don't think so. It was, and it was revoked, and then re right. revoked. Yeah, this guy's not getting it. Yeah, you had a bond for $10,000, and then you didn't show up, so your bond got revoked. Because the state is asking for a continuance, he's reinstating bond for you. Oh, this guy is lucky. I'm already posted. Yes, sir. 
your bond was removed was because you missed a court date. Your uh, 911 bonding was relieved of the bond, and the bond was set back in the original amount of fifty thousand dollars. Is what this shows on the docket. Yes, sir. So right. I'm, I'm sorry. Okay. Well, I'm setting your bond at ten thousand um, dollars to allow you to try to make it so that you can get out of jail. You and this is a felony aggravated assault. Or um, would have considered lesser a bond, but I think that's the appropriate yes, amount. Yes, thank right. you. And uh, you know, I have one thing just uh, hold so on, Mr. Beard. The bond conditions remain in effect. Yeah, so. if you make bond, the bond conditions of no contact with the alleged victim remain in effect. Okay. Yes, Your Honor. As soon as you get out of jail, you need to see Mr. Hooper with the public defender's office. Yes, sir, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you. Then I think we are ready for the sentencing hearing. State versus uh, Matthew Thomas Jackson. Stay ready. Yes, sir. Yeah. This is, this is a wild one. Strap in. Uh, we're, we're talking about a sentencing. We get into some uh, quasi-sensitive stuff here, but it's really interesting as a matter of law and facts. The fact pattern is interesting as well. Tense ready. Yes, Your Honor. All right. On April the 11th of 2022, the defendant entered a plea of guilty on a charge of sexual contact with an inmate, and he was given a sentence of two years on state probation. He was ordered to pay the court costs to have no contact with the victim. Count two uh, was dismissed. So the purpose of today's hearing is to determine the method and manner of service. Your Honor, um, the issue before the court today is whether or not he should receive judicial diversion. All right. The state wish to make an opening statement. And no spoilers in the chat for those of you who saw it. You wish to make an opening statement. All right. Call your first witness. Our statement column is Wendy James. I'm going to swear off from the testimony she gave in this case. She will prove the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Yes, it is. Thank you. Thank you. What's your name, Board? Wendy James Huey. And if I say Miss James, I apologize. That's fine. I've known you for that longer than I've known you as Huey. Longer than I've known you as Huey. Um, where do you Where are you employed? State of Tennessee. What, what Dixon County. Do we need a microphone? Do we need a microphone for her? Is that well, the mics aren't working okay. because of the speaker issue. <laughs> well, our microphone's not working because of the speaker wow. that we had going off this morning. So if you'll just speak up as loudly as you can. I work for probation and parole. All right. And what position do you have with probation and parole? I am a strong R assessor. Which is explaining what was that? I do um, interviews with inmates um, and probationers for pre-sentence investigations and strong R's. So you do uh, pre-sentence reports? Yes. All right. Uh, are you familiar with Matthew Thomas Jackson? Yes, sir. And how did you become familiar with Mr. Jackson? Um, I got assigned the pre-sentence investigation report on his case, and so I had to call and do an interview with him. Okay. And did you prepare that pre-sentence report? Yes, I did. And did you file that with the court? Yes, I did. And I believe it was filed on September the 6th of 2022. Is that correct? That's correct. And Mr. Sanders has been provided a copy of that. Your Honor, the state would like to make that an exhibit to uh, Mr. We'll, James's testimony. I have a copy of it, so I will have that copy marked as an exhibit. And um, Ms. James, it. was there a psychosexual risk assessment that was performed as part of that pre-sentence investigation? Yes, there was. And that was filed on September the 6th, or excuse me, 26, 2022. Also yes, sir. And you're going to make, uh, ask that psychosexual risk assessment be made, uh, exhibit number two, to Ms. James's testimony. Yeah, is, that, is that attached to this? I think it's separate, but it's in there together, filed separately. And by the way, like Manning, I took that little clip from earlier in his call, but I had this playing in the background. This call went forever. This guy's working his butt off, and he then he gets to this craziness. This is the strong R assessment. Like I said, it's not going to be good too. Okay. 
and um, so Ms. James, as as part of that, what what all do you do when you complete a pre sentence investigation report? Well, <clears throat> well, I talk to the um, defendant and get his um, criminal history. Well, we run an NCIC to get that also. Talk about his criminal history, his education, employment, um, residence, relationships. Um, more of that. And we do also do a strong R interview, family information. I think that's about it. All right. Um, and in this case, Mr. Um, Jackson had uh, entered a plea in this case. Is that correct? Yes. And do you know what he pled to? Yes. And what was that? It was uh, sexual contact with an inmate. And uh, take it from that and based on your interview with him, where was he employed at the time of this offense? The Humphreys County Jail. In what position was he in? Just where? Correctional officer. So he was a correctional officer at the Humphreys County Jail? Yes. And do you know who the victim was in this case? Um, Mr. Nelms. Derek Nelms, is that correct? Yes. All right. Um, you stated that you met with Mr. Jackson in preparing this report, is that correct? We spoke over the phone. Spoke over, did a phone interview? Yes, telephone interview. What did, um, what was his uh, version of the facts of this case? He admitted to what he did. He did say he felt horrible about it. It would never happen again. This has been a nightmare for him. Um, so, and granted, I know it's explicit, but what did he admit to doing? He admitted, we didn't, he didn't go into graphic detail about what he did, but he did admit to having sexual contact. Okay. Did he, with the other did he tell you at all what he did? Did he admit to any specific act? Not specific, no. Okay. That all came from the report. Okay. Um, do you review the court file when you do a pre-sentence report? Yes. Um, and in this particular scenario, there was a statement given by Mr. Jackson that was a part of that and that you've included in your pre-sentence report. Yes. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. And um, what was his statement to the Humphreys County Sheriff's Office? I believe it was on 428 of 20. You need to read the full statement? Please. <laughs> Okay. He said, sometime during the week of April 19th through 26, 2020, while working in the Humphreys County Jail as a corrections officer, I had contact with inmate Derek Nelms as part of my duties. During one contact, Nelms asked me if he could use my cell phone to watch porn videos. Nelms had previously exposed himself with an erect penis to me. I left my phone in the shower of women's cell number two for Nelms to use. Nelms then watched porn on my phone and then took a video of himself masturbating on my phone. Later this same day, I went to take a cup of water to Nelms. Nelms took the water and then leaned in to me and we kissed. Later, Nelms took my phone again with my permission and he again watched porn videos and again jacked off. I then used my phone and took two photos of Nelms laying in the bed while Nelms was nude and again with an erect penis. I kept the video and photos a couple of days and deleted them from my phone. A day or so later, Nelms and I talked and agreed that we couldn't continue. Since this time, Nelms has asked for my phone again, but I have refused. Nelms has not made any threats toward me. I regret the actions and wish it had not happened. I never threatened Nelms and he has not made any threats to me. The contact between us was consent and no force was used. All right. And, um Again, Mr. Jackson didn't make any statement to you specifically about what he did, but he did admit to sexual contact with an inmate. Yes, and he, he did state that they kissed, but okay. they didn't go right. further than that. Now, again, you looked at the court file and, and the agency statements and the agency reports as part of your pre-sentence report. Yes. I won't ask you to read it specifically, but uh, in the investigation with into this matter, the police talked with Mr. Nelms, did they not? Yes, they did. Now, did you try to talk to Mr. Nelms? I did try to talk to Mr. Nelms, and he said he did not want to make any further statements. He refused to talk to you? Yes. But you did review his statements to Captain Anderson, is that correct? There were, yeah, there was a, a lot in here. Yes, and that, that's part of your pre-sentence yes. report. And 
again, I won't ask you to read it, but just to, to say yep. it's much more graphic in detail, is it not? Very graphic. Very graphic in detail. And involves much more sexual contact than a kiss. Is that yes. correct? Yes. Uh, and that statement from the agency is made a part of your pre-sentence report. Yes. And is, is in your pre-sentence report that's been made an exhibit to your file. Yes, it is. Okay. Now, Mr. Jackson does not have a criminal history other than this plea. Is that correct? That's correct. What's his educational background? Um, he graduated. Interesting. Um, he graduated from Waverly Central High School in 2014, and he has not completed any further education, but he has stated that he would like to go back to school. Um, according to your report, when you met with him or talked with him, was he uh, was he working? Yes. Where was he working? At McDonald's. Okay. Um, he lives here in Hubbard County? He lives in Holiday. Holiday, Denton County? Yes. All right. Um, now, you mentioned that you did a strong R assessment. Is that correct? Yes. Um, what is that? A strong R assessment um, gauges the needs and risks of the offender, um, things that he could do to keep him from reoffending, and what it had recommended is that he um, continue his education and that he have a psychosexual evaluation. Which he had. Which he had. Okay. At the time of the report, I had not received the sure. results of that yet. Sure. Now I'm looking at your strong R report, which is part of your pre-sentence report. And in what I'm seeing, it says risk level low, moderate, high. What does that mean? Low is generally um, people that we don't believe would reoffend. Okay. Um, moderate is where most people fall. Okay. Um, high risk is that they're at a high risk of reoffending. So why would what what in the strong R assessment made Mr. Jackson a moderate instead of a low? I can't say 100%, but it's probably the fact that he scored high on aggression, or he scored higher on aggression, because his moderate needs were education and aggression. Okay. And that it hasn't been very long since his offense, so as time goes by, that would also go down if he stays out of trouble. All right. So um, he did take the psychosexual assessment. Have you reviewed that? I looked over it, yes. Were there any recommendations from that? Yes, there were. Um, what were those? There was a recommendation that he um, go into sex offender treatment program. Okay. And he, as far as I know, has signed up for that and is on a waiting list. So this, this hearing is to determine if he's diversion eligible. So on probation, are you his probation officer? No. Who is his probation officer? Do you know? You don't know. Tara Page. But I don't know her personally. Okay. But um, Do you know what level of supervision he's on on probation? I don't know. If you don't, that's fine. Yeah, I don't. No, that's fine. I think that's all I have for Mr. Well, Mr. Sanders, you have any questions? And Ms. James, um, Mr. Hornet calls you by your married name, and I don't know your married name. I've known you. It's Q E H U G H E Y. I've known you for a long time, so it's difficult for yeah. me to not call you Ms. James. It's okay. Now, um, that's How many saying. conversations were you able to have with, with Mr. Jackson? I had multiple conversations with him because when I was doing the report, there were other things that I wanted to ask him about, his family and things like that. So we did talk a few times on the phone, and then we text some too. And um, was he, during those conversations, I mean, was he, did he voluntarily talk with you or was any any problems at all with him? No, he was there with you and talking. No, no, he was respectful and cordial and always responded immediately when I messaged him or tried to call him. Now, your your assessment that you ran found him at the moderate as a moderate risk. I did not actually do that interview. That interview was done by his officer. I just pulled the report, and he did score moderate on that. 
And did I hear you say that when, when you do these examinations, the majority of the people that are assessed fall within that range? Yes. Um, and part of that, part of the reasoning he landed in that moderate range was because of the charge and the conviction and the plea itself. Yes. And how close in time it was to the assessment being done. Yes. So as time goes on, that that changes that risk level? Yes, it does. Okay. Now, um, how old is Mr. Jackson? Hmm. He was born in 94. He's 27. 27? 27, okay. 28? Okay. And He's 28. 28. And um, did he indicate to you that he'd never been in any type of any type of trouble before? Yes. Did he talk? Did you all talk about um, steps that he needed to take or that he had taken as far as correction goes? We talked about things he had done on, you know, on probation that he was complying with the rules of probation, and he did express that he wanted to further his education, but he was afraid that this offense would keep him from getting a job if he did get a degree. Um, and he said he was willing to do whatever he had to do um, to be compliant. So whatever orders the court put on him, he would be glad to comply with. So the assessment that his other probation officer did recommended the psychosexual risk assessment, correct? Yes. And he completed that. Yes. And it made recommendations. Yes. And he has signed up for those and is awaiting for those to yes. start. Is your understanding? Mm -hmm. um, was he was he open and agreeable to doing the things that had been requested or recommended of him? Yes. In these assessments? Yes. Did you all talk about his his family? Did his family come up during the meeting? We yes, we did, uh, because one of the questions was uh, how this has affected his family. And um, I know that he's limited on some of the contact he can have with his family. That's been really hard on him because he states he is very close with his family. Do you know, are they, are they local? Is, is his family local yes, in this yes. area? He, yes, his mother has been employed with Walmart, I think, since around 2008. Was there anything that was discussed about his um, physical or, or mental health that was extraordinary? No, I don't believe he said he had any physical or mental health problems. Did he, did he express to you um, regret and remorse over, over this incident and what happened? Yes, he did. He said he was ashamed that, of what he had done and that he would never do anything like this again. It's, like I said, it's been, he said it's been a nightmare for him and his family. And to your knowledge, he was, he was terminated from working for the Humphreys County a jail, correct? Yes, to my knowledge. And do you know how quickly he was able to secure another another job after that? I'm not sure on that. Do you did, did you all discuss his personal life? Do you know anything about his personal life? I know that he uh, has been with his partner for over two years, and they think they recently bought a home together. And he's working full time at McDonald's. Yeah, is he a manager. I believe he's a manager. Now? Manager, yes, I think that's all I had. Now, redirect, Joe. You said you, uh, in response to Mr. <coughs> Sanders' question, Ms. Hugh, you stated that you uh, talked with and communicated with Mr. Jackson several times. Yes, I was looking back over your pre sentence report again while I was listening to your testimony. Um, the, the statement that you read that he gave to law enforcement was on 42820, is that correct? Yes, that was taken from their reports. Correct. But at the bottom of that, you state that during an interview conducted on 8322, the defendant declined to give any further statements concerning the offense. Yes, that was off of his personal questionnaire. On okay. his personal questionnaire, he put uh, that he did not want to give any further statements. Okay. But then you said that during some conversation he did admit to kissing the inmate. Yes, he did admit okay. to kissing. I just I want to make sure I misunderstood. Yeah, that. we just didn't go in detail. He said he didn't really want to go through all that. No, again. Through all the details. Okay. Thank you. That's all, Your Honor. Recross. No, Your Honor. Thank you, ma'am. You may sit down and have a seat. State may call your next witness. That's the state's proof. State has rested their proof. Mr. 
Sanders, you were still on for me? It is. Yes, Your Honor, it was on. Oh, Kerry Moore, Your Honor. Sorry. Kerry Moore. You saw me swear or affirm that the testimony I give in this case should be the truth, whole truth, and nothing but the truth to have to die. Okay. Have a seat, please. Can you please state your name? Karen Moore. And Ms. Moore, um, what is your relationship to Mr. Matthew Jackson? He's my nephew. Okay. And so can I presume that you've known him his whole life? Yes. Um, during, for the time that you've known him, have you ever known Mr. Jackson to um, be in any sort of yes. trouble? Indeed. Sort at all? No, sir. You know him to go through, he went through school here in Humphreys County? Yes. Uh, received a diploma? Yes, sir. Are you, are you aware of any um, issues that he dealt with in school as far as behavioral issues or anything like that goes? No, not that I'm aware of. Um, how would you describe your, your nephew? He's a kid that would do anything for anyone. Um, he's always been there to help. He was on the fire department. He was working for the Humphreys County Sheriff's Department when this occurred. Um, he's never done anything wrong. What, this um, is, what role did he have in the Humphreys County Fire Department? Um, he was a volunteer firefighter. And do you know how long he did that? Um, I'm not absolutely sure, no, but I know it was for quite some time. Have you, have you found him to be a helpful person when, when help was needed with Okay. So I've asked him to help me with several things, and he's always been there to help. He's always there to help with his mom, anybody that's ever asked him to help. Now, is your family a close, a close-knit family? Yes, sir. Where do you all, as far as the family, do you all live in this in this geographical area? Yes. Okay, where do you live? I live on Clyden Road. Here in Humphreys County? Yes, sir. And... Mr. Jackson's mother and father, where, where do they live? They live on Burns Street. In, in here in Humphreys County? Yes, here in Humphreys County. Do you know anything, is there anything about Mr. Jackson's um, mental health? Are you aware of any mental health issues no, that he has? What about health, physical health issues? Any, any no, sir. That's all you're on. Mr. Hornick? Carrie, C A R I E. C A R I E. Uh huh, yes, sir. Right. Thank you, Ms. Mills. Um, and, and you said that Mr. Jackson is your nephew? Yes, sir. And is, just weird. is that by marriage or biologically? No, he's biologically my okay. nephew. Is, are you married? His mother, father, how are you? His mother. Is your sister? Yes, she's my sister. All right. okay. Um, Ms. Moore, unfortunately, I'm probably going to ask you some uncomfortable questions. Um, you know what Mr. Jackson pled to? Yes, sir. Have you talked with him at all about this case? Um, I have talked with him just a little bit because he's not been able to be around any of us since a lot of this has happened. So. And, and why would he not be allowed to be around you? I don't know. I mean, I, I haven't. He's not been not around me. He just, his conditions of probation have him in his county, I guess. Okay. He has to be there at a certain time. Sure, sure. Stuff like that. So sure. Sure. location has kept us apart. Um, so have you and he talked about any of the facts of this case? No. So do you know what he's accused of doing? Um, yes, I've heard what he's accused of doing, yes. Okay. Is that just today? Uh, no, I had heard prior to that. Okay. What, had, what had you heard that he had done? Um, I had heard that he had given the inmates a cell phone. Mm -hmm. um, other than that, I didn't really hear anything else. Okay. Um, and, and so you understand <clears throat> that he pled guilty to this? Yes. Okay. Um, and the reason I say that is that he'd never done anything wrong. Obviously, he acknowledged doing something wrong. Well, to, to like to me or to any member of his family, not sure. not uh, he's never done anything other than this unlawful that I am aware sure. of ever. Do you um, realize that as a correctional officer, there should are supposed to be boundaries that you don't cross? Oh, I I absolutely do. 
Um, and and are you aware that the accusations made by the, the victim of this case are much more graphic than they just kissed once? Um, that's from my understanding from what was read, yes. This prosecutor's okay overall, but he lo he lost his ever freaking mind going down this line of questioning with this sympathetic aunt. He does not need this witness to make the argument he wants to make. I cannot believe he's doing it. I cannot believe it. Other than that, he's fine, but it, it, this is a horrible lapse of judgment, in my opinion. Okay. That's just from what was read. You have yes, not I have had any communication. Yeah. Okay. Um, but you understand that there's much more sexual contact alleged, and he pled guilty to this, than just simply a kiss. Yes. And um, but that certainly would be crossing the line. Well, I would agree with that. I would be crossing a line if it was proven. Okay. And, but he pled guilty to it, right? Yes, he pled guilty. Okay. Um, and so I know he's your nephew, so questions I'm asking you are putting you in an odd spot. Not yes. Um, yeah, and for no good reason. But our correctional officers, we, officers and our police officers, we expected a little bit higher standard of conduct from them, do we not? Yes. Um and are, are you this is so bad he's he's effectively badgering a witness that doesn't argue with him she agrees with it it i i don't get what he's doing are you aware of what this hearing actually is for um i i am assuming that it's for a pretrial diversion is what i'm under the understanding something similar do you know what that means yes it means that he's never done anything before and that this is his time to, uh, he's not, you know, to get um, a free pass, basically. Something like that, yes. Okay. Thank you, Elaine. Um, Hi, Scotland. So let's forget that he's your nephew for a minute. All right. If a, if a police officer, um, do you have any children? I have three. Okay, boys, girls? I have two boys and a girl. Okay, well, let's just use your daughter as an example. If a police officer, uh, yeah, yeah, he's about to do that. Yes, he's going to ask the hypothetical question that which we can all think of and is obvious and just and just rude for no good reason. Would you like something horrible to happen to your daughter? No, no, I wouldn't. All you've proved is that you have no sense. You can make that argument without the witness. The judge wants to crush you right now had sexual contact with your daughter in their official capacity, would you think they should be punished? Yes. Do you think they should be able to get that off their record in the future? I think that every circumstance has a different, you know, um, reason. So you wouldn't expect that officer to be held to a higher standard? Oh, I, I absolutely would expect the officer to be held to a higher standard. Yes. Yes, we need to tase the prosecutor. And by the way, he's not making an argument I don't agree with or a point that I don't see. I, I agree with everything he's doing. This, the strategy and approach is god-awful. Yes. Than, than a normal person. Yes. Okay. That's all, Jeff. Thank you, Ms. Moore. Mm -hmm. right. Thank you, ma'am. You messed up there. Call Ms. Bridget Rushing, Your Honor. Where we're from, the test motion I give in this case shall be the truth, whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you God. Thank you. Have a seat, please. Please state your name. Bridget Rushing. And Ms. Rushing, Rushing, you are Mr. Matthew Jackson's mother, is that correct? Yes. And where do you reside? I reside in, on Burn Street. We've lived there for 16 years. And with whom do you live? I live with my husband and my other two, please. Okay. How many children do you have? I have seven in all. I have two in heaven and five that are here with me. Okay. And that's five, including, including you go by Matthew at home? Yes. Okay. And um, you, are his, you are his biological mother, yes. correct? You, you've raised him his whole From life. From day one. Um, has, he, has he ever 
been any type of trouble at at school or given you any type of trouble at home or anything like that? He's never been in trouble. He's always been my good kid. Um, anybody that he's ever come across, he went to church. Growing up, he was in church all the time. Um, he did their music at church and when he was in high school, he went to, and he was in criminal justice, um, Officer Triplett, God rest his soul. He um, was his teacher, and him and Greg had a really close bond. He did really good in school. I mean, I can't, there's not, I, I can't think of anything that he's ever done wrong other than this right here. He graduated from Waverly Central yes. High School, uh, got a normal standard well, he um, he struggled a little bit, and he was in like a remedial reading and stuff, and he had to work ten times harder than all the regular students in school to get a regular education, so he didn't fall backwards and get like a I don't know what the other diplomas they get, but he got a. This part just breaks my heart. Both the aunt and the mom just just saying horrible stuff that they don't want to say. This is from the defense attorneys trying to be helpful, but just who wants to say this about their child? I understand the circumstances, but uh, it's it's just awful. Regular education, but he had to work for it. And did he did he begin to work pretty quickly after he graduated from high school? Well, he worked during high school. He was um, he started his actual first job was McDonald's, and uh, he's been working ever since. While he was in high school, he started there, mm -hmm. and then yes. he, when he left McDonald's, is that when he went to work for the Humphreys County Jail? He, no, he um, after that he had worked. I know he had worked security, but he was also a volunteer firefighter. Um, he worked in security. Uh, sorry, Mama Pajato, I don't know how to do it, but I blocked you by accident. I was trying to block the bots. I'll figure it out. And then he was, you said he's also a volunteer fireman yes. here in Humphreys County. Yes. And then the jail. Yes. When he, when he was terminated from the jail because of what happened in this case, um, how quickly did he go back and start working at, at McDonald's? I'm not sure what the time frame was. I, he was working at another job in security after he had lost his job at the jail. But he had lost that job at the security place because of this, because they wouldn't let, allow him to continue until this was taken care of. So after that, he got his job at McDonald's. Would you agree that your family is, is close? We are very close. Are you a large, a large family? Yes. And has Matthew, Mr. Jackson, um, has he always been a been a part of that of that family unit? Until he until all of this, he's missed his nieces and nephew, um, first birthdays, he's missed parties, he's missed his little brother's first football game. Have you have you talked with him about those things that he's not been able to be part of? Yes. And has he, has he expressed sadness about that? Matthew don't cry a whole lot, but he does with me, and I'm sorry. This has just been really hard by having him part of our family when we need him later. Thank you. He's part of our rock, and when he's not there, you can fill a big void. Now, does Matthew have any type of mental health diagnosis or no anything like that? What about physically? Anything physically that he struggles with or, or no. deals with from that standpoint? Yeah. At his other jobs where he's worked, are you aware of any um, disciplinary <clears throat> problems that he's He's never been in trouble. Any other job or no, he's, school? No, he's always succeeded and exceeded expectations at his jobs. He's never had any issues. Has, has he talked with you about wanting to go back to school? Yes, he wants to go back to school in business. And he wants to start his own business. 
that's all I have, Your Honor. Mr. Warnick, am I cross-examined? Ms. Rushing, I know that, and, and is that how you say your last name, Rushing? To say yes. Right? Okay. I want to make sure. I know this is it's difficult for you, Ms. Rushing. It's difficult to ask you these questions, but um, have you been able to talk to Mr. Jackson about this case at all? Yes. Have you talked to him about the facts of this case? Yes. Okay. Um, so did he make any admissions to you about what happened? Just what he had said about the kissing, he admitted to the cell phone, and he promised me that he didn't do anything else. I understand. But, uh, and I know you're not an attorney and you're not part of the investigative team, but you understand that there was much more involved in the investigation and what allegedly happened. I didn't know that until today. Okay. And... Again, completely unnecessary. Completely unnecessary. You do not need to rake this mother over the coals to make any of the arguments that you want to make. Ugh. I won't get into the extreme graphic details, but it, it, was, it was actual sexual contact, not just kissing. Are you aware of that? No. And I know Mr. Jackson's your son. Yes, she was, you jag off, but I can't believe you're asking her this. But I asked his aunt, your sister, <sighs> would you agree that we should hold correctional officers and police officers and deputies to a higher standard than we should others? Yes, I do. Um, and let's just, just assume that Matthew's telling you the truth and that he only kissed him. That's inappropriate, is it not? It is inappropriate. Certainly if there was actual oral sex involved, that would be inappropriate. Yes. Um, I will ask you the same question I asked your sister. You have other children that are still <laughs> here don't. living with us, right? Yes. And if someone sexually abused them, I'm assuming you'd probably be pretty upset. Yes. Even if it was consensual. Yes. And if it was an officer, would you expect that officer to be held to a higher standard? Yes. And I know that's a hard question. It's, it's kind of not fair for me to ask it. It's an incredibly stupid question. You can make this argument to the judge. It's an appropriate argument. The, the witness's response to that question means nothing. Nothing. In terms of what you can argue to the judge here. Stop it. But... But to elaborate on that, sure. can, I, can I elaborate on Absolutely. that? Absolutely. I understand that he needs, to, he needs to be punished for what he did wrong. But I don't think that he needs to be punished forever. And I don't think that he should have to have this held over his head so he can go on in life and do better, because I know he wants to do better. And we want him to do better. But you realize that if... Uh, if, he, if the judge decides to give Mr. Jackson judicial diversion, at some point this completely comes off his record. And do you know what that would mean he could do? Well, he could do it again, but I know he won't. He could be a correctional officer again. I don't think that, I don't think in his heart of hearts he would ever, ever do that again. I understand, but you probably didn't think he would do it this time, did you? No. Redirect. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. You my up. Great. You just beat up two family members for no apparent reason whatsoever. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> if he needs yeah, to say so fine, do it. But he doesn't. Can you re, uh, rebuttal proof? No, sir, you don't. I'll hear you in argument. One moment. Your Honor, um, of course, Mr. Jackson has pled guilty to, to sexual contact with an inmate. Um, he pled guilty, took a two-year sentence, and, and what we're here for today is to determine if he's eligible for 40, 35, 313. Um, I don't know. Did you run? Did you run? <laughs> <laughs> we'll agree to make 
this an exhibit judge that are broadside. Um, according to the TBI, he is he's eligible. He got no prior records. I will admit that. Um, but it's the state's position, Your Honor, that sometimes some people just don't deserve diversion. In this case, Mr. Jackson has admitted that uh, he certainly kissed Mr. Nelms. He admits that he um, allowed him to use his phone uh, to watch pornographic movies while he was in the jail. He admits that he took a photo and, and he was exposed to Mr. Nelms uh, naked, at least from the waist down. Um, Did he just say naked? Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, that's still funny. And of course, the, the court file the and the pre-sentence report uh, show the statements from the from the inmate, uh, Mr. Nelms, at the time, and, and gave his statement. And I granted he did not want to give Miss James or Miss Hugh, excuse me, a statement any further about what happened. Um, but it's a part of the pre-sentence report, and and honestly, Your Honor, I just couldn't bring myself to, to ask about the facts with his family. It's, it's graphic in nature, as graphic in nature as anything that I have read in eight years, and that's kind of scary. You know, Mr. Nett, Mr. Jackson promises his family he wouldn't do it again, but we have a person who is a correctional officer who is in jail who is supposed to be overseeing inmates. And he's admitted to, at least at a minimum, kissing him. But Mr. Nam states that he let him use his phone, that he got extra food, that there was oral sex. And that's about as detailed as I'm going to get. The statement is in the pre-sentence report. Your Honor can read it. But it is detailed about, on multiple occasions, the sexual contact. We get it. We get it. And he admitted to it. It's all over in the report. None of this is necessary. <sighs> and the sexual nature that took place. Um, now, he denies parts of that, but he does admit kissing him. And, Your Honor, the position of the state is that we just cannot allow correctional officers or deputies, whomever they are, to put themselves in this position. Uh, and take advantage of a situation, whether it's consensual or not. Um, Mr. Nelms has not said that it was forced. Obviously, there was no, there was no rape. There was no rape by statute or rape by authority figure or anything of that nature. This appears to have been a consensual relationship. However, it, it's the state's position that we just can't have people who are in positions of authority abusing those positions of authority to have sex with inmates, whether that's kissing, whether it's oral sex, whether it's intercourse or whatever it is. And there has to be a deterrence to that. And the Okay, that is a nice cogent argument, the last 30 seconds, none of which required the testimony. I agree with all of it. I agree with the prosecutor's position. I don't agree with him needlessly abusing people. Turrence is you don't get judicial diversion. We don't think he's entitled to judicial diversion. We don't think that he should be granted judicial diversion. You know, if, if he is um, granted judicial diversion three years from now, or actually less than three years from this, he pled. That might be my on, next T-shirt. Uh, <laughs> Lot talk with Mike. I don't remember the day it was. Mike. I think it may have been. Is it in April? I can't, I can't remember the day that he pled, but three years or two years from that day, two and a half years, he can go get him a correctional job and be being right back in the jail supervising inmates again, um, swapping extra sandwiches and tobacco snuff for sexual favors. Um, and, and we just don't think that he ought to be in a position to do that. Uh, he is on the sexual sex offender registry. Um, Again, there's a an issue there. Um, in fact, Mr. Sanders may ad address it, but I want to address it in this hearing because when we entered this plea, 
We did not make that a part of the plea because, quite honestly, Mr. Sanders that, nor I knew that this offense that, was on the sex offender registry. And I'll let Mr. Sanders speak to this. But he, he and I had discussed this, and I offered to agree to allow Mr. Jackson to withdraw his plea because he was on the sex offender registry, and that's not what we originally agreed to, but it, it's a mandatory offense. I think Mr. Sanders can address it, but he that discussed that in detail with Mr. Jackson. <laughs> And Mr. Jackson said, no, I want to, to, ma to maintain my plea. I don't want to withdraw my plea. Um, and so under the statute and under the PDI sex offender right registry rules, he's on, the, he's on the sex offender registry for a minimum of 10 years. Uh, now, Mr. Colley here earlier today said he's addressed that issue before. I, I don't know that, but I know our office's position from the AG's office is we tell people it's 10 years at a minimum. Um, so that's a that's a fight for another day for not I our people office, not make me laugh during this stream. Judge, I just think in this particular scenario, um, you have officers with this kind of conduct and in a position of authority, and they are having sexual contact with inmates. That um, I think to give them diversion sends a message that is not the correct message. Um, for the actions that are taken by Mr. Jackson or others that are, are in his position. So it's the state's position that he should not be granted a 4035 Your Honor, we, we first start out, I submit that, that we can agree that he is eligible for diversion. He, the TBI has, has cleared him for diversion. And our legislature has chosen to not disqualify someone convicted of his offense from being able to receive a sentence uh, under our diversion statutes. There are certain exclusions to the, to the diversion statute. There are certain offenses that are just simply not divertible. But this particular offense that he's been convicted of and pled guilty to is not, is not one of those offenses. So... The state's position here today is that because of the nature of the offense, he, he shouldn't he shouldn't receive diversion. And while I understand that position, I, I respectfully disagree with that. Um, while it might not be appropriate in every case similar to this, um, I think that the court's analysis every day, every day. The factors that the court has to consider are number one, the accused amenability to correction. The only proof that the court has heard today in talking with Ms. Huey uh, was that Mr. Jackson um, was <laughs> remorseful and regretful for what he had done and ashamed of the, of the things that he did and that he had taken steps to um, correct that, that behavior with the assessments that had been taken and then signing up for the additional uh, counseling as recommended by the assessment. We look at the circumstances of the offense. You, you uh, can. There's danger to it. You heard case. from Ms. Huey about what Ms. Jack, Mr. Jackson said happened. Granted, in the discovery, there were, there were different statements made by the two individuals, both of which possibly rose to the level of a criminal offense. And based on that, my client chose to enter the, the guilty plea that he did. Um, but there were certainly discrepancies in the two statements about what, what, has, what happened. But there was inappropriate uh, contact, no matter who you believe, period. Um, my client answered for those actions when he entered his, his guilty plea. Um, the accused, the accused criminal record. He has no, he has no criminal record, Your Honor. He was not in any trouble before this, and there's been no proof that he's been in any trouble since this happened. Uh, his social history. The court has heard uh, today from family members about their family and where he was born and raised, and went to school, and where he works, and where he lives, and his relationship status, and, and those things. Uh, finally, uh, the accused physical and mental uh, physical and mental health. 
there's really not anything in that um, one way or the other. There's no mental health diagnosis. There's no physical health issues. And then finally, the deterrence value to the accused the um, as well as to others. You've heard from Ms. Huey that he falls within the moderate range, which is where the majority of people fall, she said. Um, and I, I submit that there's probably a low likelihood in this case of, a, um, of something happening again. And I want the court to take also note that Mr. Jackson is 28 years old, um, applying average sure life was. statistics to his life. He probably I has didn't. somewhere around 50 more years on this earth. Um, if the court denies him this judicial diversion today, then for, the, for those next five uh, decades, 50 years, he will spend that time being a convicted felon. And that will limit drastically the opportunities and the things that, that he can do. Um, I, I don't think offering him diversion diminishes what he did. Um, I, don't, I don't think that at all. Um, I think this case has had his complete attention since it happened and since we played it. It's been, it's been hanging there, and um, the court has heard what impact it, it's had on him and his family and, and their lives. Um, what I'm asking the court to do today is, is grant, grant this uh, request for judicial diversion. We feel that he meets the criteria. We know that he's eligible, and I think applying the factors that they weigh in his favor uh, to grant him judicial diversion in this case. Morning. A judge just uh, quickly, Mr. Sanders kind of went through those those factors, but I, I would point to, to two critical factors in this, the circumstances of the offense and the deterrent effect, which I talked about er earlier. Um, and the circumstances of the offense as laid out in the pre-sentence report. So do I. Um, I would say that, along with the deterrent effect, weighs heavily. There's a case, State versus Finch, uh, uh, 465 Southwest 3rd, 584, uh, and it is actually a case of State of Tennessee versus Cynthia J. Finch, uh, and she was actually a public official, and uh, she met all of the criteria that, that Mr. Sanders talked about that Mr. Jackson meets, but the, in the facts in that case, the, the Court of Criminal Appeals, she was denied diversion. The Court of Criminal Appeals said one of the factors that they uh, dealt with was public officials, and uh, this was a fraud crime and, and dealt with money. Uh, obviously, this case does not. Um, however, uh, it, it's similar in, in nature in that it is a public official. It's a person that we put in, in a position to take care of inmates and to guard those inmates. And uh, so the facts of this case and the circumstances around this particular case certainly weigh against diversion in the state's mind. And it, most people, when they get caught, they're remorseful. Um, now, we meet some that aren't remorseful, but, but most are remorseful. But, yes, he's eligible. He meets the other factors, but the circumstances of this case and the deterrent effect to not only Mr. Jackson but to others in the position of Mr. Jackson, I think, weigh greatly against Mr. Jackson getting a 40 35 report. There are many difficult cases that come before the court, <clears throat> and unfortunately I see people in their 20s routinely come before me with felony charges and convictions which render them infamous for the remainder of their lives. Uh, our state legislature has adopted <clears throat> some um, a statute that allows people to seek expungement of their record for certain crimes even though there was no judicial diversion or pretrial diversion that was entered in their case at the, at the time. And, they have the ability to come back in after a certain point in time and seek removal from it. Um, Stop it. There's no question in this case that uh, the defendant here was, in fact, eligible for, in, in the 
sense of that he has no prior criminal record and that the offense is one that allows for <clears throat> judicial diversion is not excluded by statute, that for that reason he is don't have it. Uh, eligible in the eyes of the law. Down. So it falls to the court to consider. Um, and as Mr. Sanders pointed out, those factors that the court must consider are as follows. The defendant's amenability to correction, the circumstances of the offense, the defendant's criminal record, the defendant's social history, the defendant's physical and mental health, and the deterrence value to the defendant and others. An additional consideration is whether the judicial diversion will serve the ends of justice, i.e. the interest of the public as well as the defendant. And that is case law. It's almost like this judge knows what he's talking about. It's cited in State versus Robinson, 328 Southwest 3rd, 513, 2009, Court of Criminal Appeals decision. And they are citing the Parker case, which is one of the first cases, Parker, uh, which is cited at 932 Southwest 2nd, 958, having to do with this particular situation. So when I look at the situation, those are all factors that I have to consider. <clears throat> In the Robinson case that I cited, she was a nurse in the jail, and she was placed in a position of trust and actually then began to um, engage in drug transactions within the jail and had no prior criminal record, and otherwise uh, she uh, met all the criteria, and the trial court denied her request for pre-trial diversion, or ju post-trial uh, diversion, judicial diversion. And uh, the Robinson Appellate Court made this ruling. After hearing the evidence, the trial court concluded that the circumstances of the offense weighed heavily against the grant of diversion, but noted that the appellant's clean criminal history weighed in favor of the grant of diversion. The trial court noted that the appellant's amenability to correction was shown by, her act, by the appellant's action namely the fact that the appellant sought treatment for the drug addiction by herself on her own initiative prior to the hearing. Specifically, the trial court acknowledged okay, the man. merits of the progress the I'll appellant had made since after. her arrest. However, the trial court concluded that the need for deterrence was high because it was, quote, a horrible offense, end quote, and that the appellant had abused a position of trust as an employee of the county. The trial court found that the deterrence was a very public issue and that the grant of judicial diversion would not serve the public interest or the ends of justice. And that end, despite the factors weighing in the favor of diversion, the trial court concluded that the appellant had not shown her suitability for judicial diversion. The trial court felt it clear that the appellant's case was a not a case. We should exercise our discretion to grant judicial diversion. After reviewing the evidence presented to the trial court at the sentencing hearing, the appellate court determined that the trial court considered the necessary factors Thank and you. that there was substantial evidence That's to awesome. support the trial court's denial of judicial diversion. <clears throat> they affirmed that uh, denial of diversion. And I cite that case because the factual situation in that that was an employee of a jail, uh, instead of engaging in sexual contact with inmates, was engaging in drug transactions instead. So when I look at the factors in this case and consider that clearly it's not a good sign when the judge starts citing a case that's on point and uh going against you i feel for the defense attorney here who has now read the tea leaves looking at um number one the defendant's amenability to correction apparently he might be amenable i would observe that while the defendant does not have the burden of proof in a criminal case uh prior to his conviction uh, in a situation where he's requesting that the court provide us or uh, take uh, give him an opportunity such as this that the defendant did not present himself to testify about his amenability to, board, to, board, to correction <laughs> or any steps that he had taken he relied upon his family to do so that's his choice the circumstances of the offense uh, we'll deal with in a moment his criminal record is clear he had no criminal record his social history was presented by his family. True. Um, and again, he did not testify, so therefore I don't have any direct evidence from him. The defendant's physical and mental health, I have no indication that he is suffering from any sort of mental or physical disabilities. And 
Number six, the deterrence value to the defendant and others, um, as well as the interest of the public, as well as the defendant, uh, whether it would serve the ends of justice, the interest of the public. So when I look at that, uh, those factors that I have not dealt with, I will uh, turn to the evidence that's presented in the pre-sentence report. And again, while it's clear that there are differing views of this, I would simply point out that um, the version given by the investigator that investigated the victim in this case, uh, and we can't forget that there was a victim in this case even if he was an inmate. Inmates are human. I mean, they are, they are people just like everyone else. And so the, the defendant, Mr. Nelms, or rather the victim, Mr. Nelms, gave uh, a statement that was markedly different than what Mr. Uh, Jackson gave in his own statement. <clears throat> the interview revealed that Mr. Jackson had engaged in inappropriate sexual contact with him and, while he was in the jail, and that uh, during one of the, the so that he came to his cell on a regular basis, that during one of the visits, that Nelms had asked Jackson for a cigarette and some dip, and Jackson told him that he would think about it and followed it up by asking what would he get in return. Nelms said later that Jackson brought a cup of two pouches of dip inside and said, here's your water. And then Nelm said it, in the beginning, Jackson kissed him and then he kissed him back. Now that's consistent at that point as to what supposedly took place. It is an ongoing problem. Uh, and I don't mind stating that one of the problems we have in our correctional institution, whether it's a local county jail or a state prison, is that there are inmates who are receiving inappropriate uh, material cell phones are being uh, given to inmates. They're conducting drug transactions from within the walls of the prison and the jail using, using things that, that correctional officers have given to them for one reason or another. <clears throat> um, it goes on to say that Jackson let Nelms borrow his cell phone so he could watch some pornographic videos. He watched porn videos and he masturbated. Later, Jackson asked to see Nelms' penis. So Nelm showed it to him. Nelm stated that, it, uh, that Jackson actually performed oral sex on him. Um, that's markedly different than what Mr. Jackson said occurred. Um, here's the interesting part about that. Nelm said he asked Jackson to stop, and he stopped when asked to do so. But Nelm stated that he was on suicide watch at the time that this happened. So you have an inmate on suicide watch in the jail who is being uh, sexually uh, engaged with a, a correctional officer who was charged with protecting that inmate. Anyway, uh, after that, says that Nelms gave him more pouches of dip <clears throat> and that he would bring him an extra sandwich to come into his cell multiple times, that he again borrowed Jackson's cell phone and watched... Uh, See, Judge knows how to do this. He can lay it all out in a sort of clinical law sort of way, get everything you want, including the nasty. You can say it. He's saying, you know, he used his influence and he raped him. But he's saying it nicely and he's saying it in open court. No one's getting hurt. It's just true. There's a way to do this. Videos, there's more graphic information in Mr. Nelms' statement that I'm not going to read. Um, but it, it clearly establishes that there was an ongoing sexual activity that had happened for uh, an extended period of time, and it was not just uh, a, an isolated instance. Um, so when I have cases where it's presented to me that inmates within correctional institutions are running drug operations using cell phones presented to them by the correctional officers. And I see a situation such as this where clearly the circumstances are that the inmate, um, and we can't forget the dynamics of power that occur in a jail. I mean, a correctional officer <clears throat> would, although they're not all uh, clearly, we have many good correctional officer, but you have a correctional officer who exerts their influence over an inmate to engage in a sexual offense is reprehensible. Now, because this was a same-sex type situation, it would be easier for some people to say that that was no harm, no foul. Had this been a female inmate and the correctional officer had engaged in, in that type of sexual inter, uh, intercourse or inter, interaction, clearly it would be 
to some people, a much more serious offense. And I see no distinction between them. You have an inmate who is at the mercy of correctional officers and a correctional officer who is using his ability to provide him with uh, additional amenities in the sentence uh, while he's serving a sentence such as a phone, such as a, a uh, cigarettes or pouches of dip or whatever it is that he's giving him extra sandwiches. He's it. using his position to uh, exert power and control over that inmate. Absolutely. And as a result of that, the circumstances of this case indicate to me that there was clearly uh, at least subtle coercion, if not coercion, because of the simple fact that he was manipulating this inmate by giving him benefits that he would not otherwise receive in return for the sexual interaction that they have. The deterrence value to others, um, clearly one of the things as I've hit upon several times in this discussion is the fact that we have a serious problem in our state prisons and, and probably in some local jails where inmates are being given an opportunity to conduct outside business from inside the walls of the prison or jail. And this is simply an example of a lesser amount. Um, clearly, there was no drug transactions taking place, but this is something that was given to an inmate by the use of a cell phone that was unacceptable. And if we are going to deter those kinds of things, then we must have some sort of uh, accountability for it. And in this court's opinion, that deterrence value is very high in this particular case. But lastly, as in the Robinson case, the interest of justice have to be served at some point. I'm sorry that Mr. Tom, uh, Mr. Jackson is engaged in this conduct. I'm sorry he's 28 years old and he may have a felony conviction on his record. But it is this court's opinion that his conduct in this case does not warrant and nor have I found any evidence other than his family who loves him dearly and wants to try to help him that anything before this court that substantiates that he is justified in having a, a grant of judicial diversion. So the request for judicial diversion is respectfully denied. Well, there you have it. Uh, right before they said we're do doing a sentencing, it really wasn't a sentencing in the sense that it was really just dealing with the request for diversion. <laughs> Stop it. You guys still managed to make me laugh through the middle of that. I don't care. I still got my consternation out. It's okay. It's okay. We'll, we'll get through it. And I see, I see all of you telling me that Judge Manning is courtroom. I, I have to leave Judge Manning alone. Her, her, her call is too entertaining, though. <laughs> but that one was wild. I appreciate you hanging with me on it. Uh, I just thought it was super interesting. The prosecutor made me insane. Here's, here's how annoying the prosecutor was. I did not disagree with anything he was saying. Nothing. Nothing. I absolutely agreed with him. I, I, he made a lot of sense. Everything was fine. The, just the gratuitous beating up of family members just rubbed me the wrong way. It just rubbed me the wrong way. It, in terms of his legal argument, yes, of course. Uh, you know, th this is very bad. The judge agreed with him, too. And if he's in front of this judge, he's got to know. I mean, this is a this is a, like the second or third time I've seen this judge. But if you're practicing in front of this judge, you know he's not buying this diversion. You don't need to beat up family members. You know where he's going. I know where the judges are going 83.276% of the time that I've been in front of more than more than a handful of times. I know what they're going to do. I already know what they're going to do. I know what they're going to do when I draft the motion or when I respond to the motion. Once in a while, they surprise me, but rarely, rarely. This judge wasn't granting this diversion. He's a law and order guy. He did it. He and not, he not only was like not granting it, he read every applicable case that was cited. He knew exactly what he was doing. That's why I was yawning in the middle. He had briefed this thing out. He had done his homework. He knew what he was doing. He was going to let he was going to let the hearing proceed. He, he was am amenable to change if something surprised him, but nothing surprised him. 
There was nothing new. It was it was some family member saying, oh, please have mercy on him, effectively. That doesn't surprise him. And, and it's nice, and he, and he felt compassion for them, but he wasn't letting this guy off. You, you don't need to over-argue this thing. You, you can mention it once in argument. You don't need to, to, to drag witnesses through it. Ah, so there we are. I don't know what's going on. Somebody who got arrested who shouldn't have been and spent some time in jail, and then they're in front of Manning. I don't, I'm sure it was good. I'm sure it was good. But but if I don't, her her calls just, I felt this way about Simpson too. At some point, I'm going to get a restraining order from one of them. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, Judge. I want to leave you alone, but your call's too interesting. It just is. Just, there's just too much crazy that happens over there, and I've I've got to I've got to cover it. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> well, thank you all, thank you all. I'm still a little mad because you're making me laugh in the middle of a of a serious case. I just still feel the case is interesting, but that doesn't mean you're not funny. When you're suggesting such things as um, naked pretrial throuple, <laughs> how am I supposed to ignore that? I mean, that the fact that that's funny does not diminish the fact that this is a horrible crime, okay? <laughs> My brain can handle both of those things at the same time. <laughs> that's how I roll. All right. You guys are the best. Thank you for coming out. I will see you all soon.